Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us today at our Lost at Sea Container Stack Losses webinar. We'll make a, a slow start, give people a last bit of chance to, to jump on the screen. Uh, hopefully a few more will join us. This is the first of our container ship based webinars. I'm not going to say it's the uh, first and last. There could be more. We'll keep you posted. A couple of rules to go through real quickly. I won't take up too much of your time with this. If possible, if you're not presenting or you're not on the panel, uh, could you try and keep yourself on mute? Uh, it can uh, affect others and, and you get quite a lot of echo when you're presenting as well. Um, if you have any questions, you can either wait till the end. Feel free to uh, ask as we go along if you wish. Uh, try to use the speech bubble uh, uh, to type your question out if possible. If we don't get around to your question or something strikes you later on after you've attended the webinar, please feel free to email any of us uh, and we will, of course, uh, get those back to you. OK, uh, we're going to start by a very uh, brief introduction to today's panel, starting with Tom Bevington. Tom, do you want to introduce yourself to everybody? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Bevington. I run a maritime operations consulting firm out here in Singapore. I've been in the shipping industry for the uh, last 23 years or so, sailing up to the, the rank of second officer on container ships before moving ashore to take up the role of uh, central planner with Merskline. And then for the last 10 years, I've been working out here in uh, Singapore on a lot of operational projects for major shipping lines and terminals globally, with a particular focus on operational efficiency, productivity and vessel safety. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, good to have you on board. Myself and Tom sailed together when I had hair, uh, so quite a few years ago. Um, but it's good to be working alongside him again. Um, We've also uh, pleased to be able to say that we've got some representatives from HFW here. Craig, do you want to go first and introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, John. Um, uh, my name is Craig Neem. Um, I'm a partner in the international law firm HFW. Um, I'm based in the London office, but spend quite a lot of time uh, traveling the world, at least in normal times. Um, I do shipping work generally, but have a particular speciality um, in relation to container shipping, just put my camera on because I see Tom has done that. Um, and uh, container shipping and logistics. Um, I generally act for container shipping lines and also non uh, vessel operating owners as well. Uh, the work I tend to get involved with tends to be uh, contractual disputes, so charter party disputes, vessel sharing agreement disputes, slot charter disputes, etc. Um, but also, and probably the most uh, demanding bit of my practice, which I enjoy the most, is in relation to casualties. So I do a lot of work um, in relation to container vessel fires, uh, terminal vision cases, so ships knocking down cranes and smashing up berths. And last but not least, uh, over many years, been working on container stow collapses. So thanks very much to John and Nepia for inviting me to participate in today's uh, seminar. Oh, thank you for joining us. And uh, Tom Morgan, I'll have to call you Tom M for the sake since we've got two Toms. The other Tom. Yeah. Hi, <laughs> hi everyone. Um, I've, I've been with HFW for coming up to 10 years. Around four and a half of those were spent in HFW's Hong Kong office. Um, and I'm, during that those 10 years, I've been fortunate, at least from a lawyer's perspective, to have been involved in quite a number of high profile um, container casualty um cases some before the high court some in arbitration um many with craig uh, and so delta um, a pretty good experience of dealing with the casualty management right through to the myriad of contractual uh, claims that come from it whether it's under the slots under cargo uh, time charters etc um that's me thank you very much tom um i'll quickly run through the the north panel i'm sure the ladies won't mind me doing it on their behalf for those of you who don't know me, um, some of you may. Uh, I'm John Southam, a Master Mariner, Loss Prevention Executive, spent 20 plus years at sea. Um, the beginning of that career, the, or the large portion of it, was on container vessels with p and Ned Lloyd, Reed Ride Blue Star and Merce Line, uh, where I got my master's ticket sailing uh, with those companies. 
We are joined also by Gillian, who many of you will know, uh, works with the European members, senior claims executive, uh, does a lot of work um, virtually exclusively, I don't think she'll mind me saying, with the container ship members. So is well versed on uh, dealing with the aftermath of such incidents. And also Joe Clark, uh, great to have her on board, very experienced again in the, in particular in the container ship claims, uh, comes with us deputy director to hopefully answer any uh, left field uh, claims questions you may or may not have. So thank you very much to the entire panel for joining us. I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes setting the scene. Um, as we all know, anybody that's got any experience with container shipping, when we have these stowage collapses and box losses, it's usually uh, a, there's not one set cause. Uh, there's a, there's a few uh, items that raise their heads as a causative factors to these things. So if we were to talk about all of these points uh, at any great length, we would literally have a, a one or two day workshop on our hands here. So we've chosen to do this uh, in almost two halves whilst being uh, seamlessly together. The first half is going to concentrate and revolve, as you may have guessed, having uh, listened to Tom's background around the planning aspects um, and maybe some uh, weaknesses in that uh, as well with the crossover with crew, uh, which I'll cover. And then uh, the post event um, dealings will be handed over to our claims team and uh, Tom and Craig as well. Um, so hopefully maybe in the future we can touch on some of the other aspects, but for today uh, that's the plan. We're going to be following this fine vessel, the MV Plutus. She's a 10,000 TU uh, box boat, so not the world's biggest, but still a reasonable size. She is engaged on a Europe, Asia, US cross-Pacific trade. We meet her in early November on the Asia portion of that trade. The vessel is in partnership with two other liner companies and one slot charterer as well. As I said, we're joining her in the Asia portion and she is currently in Singapore. Cargo ops are pretty much complete. The agent is on board with the final paperwork. The crew are getting ready to let go. It is the 1st of November when cargo operations were completed in Singapore. Next call is Shanghai. It's about five days steaming, uh, somewhere around the 18 knots mark. And she'll be arriving in Shanghai on the 5th of November at 0600 local time. From Shanghai, the vessel will be taking part in the cross Pacific leg uh, over to Long Beach. Um, I can assure you I was a navigator at sea. That is not my uh, course plot in there, but she will be doing a planned Great Circle route up the coast of Japan to try and catch the Kurishio and then uh, northerly across to Long Beach. The scheduled crossing is 18 knots. Um, if she leaves on time, the speed required, the master is calculated for this course is about 17.5 knots. It's a fairly short stop at Shanghai. They expect about seven cranes to be working. ETD Shanghai will be the 6th of November at 2200. So as I said, we're joining the vessel. She's now departed uh, Singapore. They're past Horsburgh and they're on the way up to Shanghai. As uh, they're on their way, the central planner sends to the vessel the Priesto. The vessel receives this Priesto, however, at about midnight. So midnight one on the 5th of November. So if you remember the ETD, uh, sorry, ETA at Shanghai, that's about six hours before pilot on board at Shanghai. Now, this uh, is fairly commonplace kind of timing uh, in this day and age. But harking back to a time uh, when I was sailing and uh, Tom was first in central planning, uh, we used to be scratching at the doors a little bit and certainly picking up phones and sending emails if we didn't have that presto sort of 12 hours before, sometimes up to 24 hours before if it was at the end of an ocean leg um, for the presto. We on board as chief mate saw that as a good opportunity to start ironing out some real problems uh, with the stow. The pre-stow wasn't perfect. We had hanging cells and things like that, but it was good enough to start ironing out some real creases. Um, Tom, I, I believe that this sort of five to six hours before arrival, in this case for the MV Plutus, six hours before arrival, but at midnight is fairly commonplace these days. And that's what I'm told by some of the members crews uh, mm. as well. 
So I wonder if you could let us know what the sort of uh, lead up to this uh, with regard to central planning is. So when you get the loadout list, how much detail you have, the time frames that you have to work with these days to try and get that even this sort of very short schedule met. Yeah, so so pretty much the <clears throat> the only thing before I can do before I get the load list uh, for Shanghai is as soon as the uh, the vessel departs from Singapore, that's where I'm looking to get the uh, arrival Shanghai tank condition from from the vessel. Um, and up and after that, all I can really do is sit and wait for my load list. And normally these days, somewhere like Shanghai, I would expect to get the preliminary load list about 12 hours before the vessel berth. So in this case, we're looking at 1800 the day before. And the load plan that I get is not going to be necessarily the final load list. It's going to be a combination of actual containers, forecast containers, um, which is fine from, from a central planner point of view. But it does start to cause us problems as we get closer and closer to the birthing time. Um, from, a, from a planning point of view, I would expect to spend at least somewhere between four and six hours doing this, this stowage. Um, Obviously, it depends on the complexity of the storage, but especially when you're looking at the very last port in the, the rotation in this case, that's the one which is probably the most challenging. Um, I have very little space to play with on the ship. I don't have many options at this point. And given that I'm only going to be sending this or I'm going to know what my stow looks like about six hours before the ship arrives, that gives a very, very short window of time for any communication with the vessel, virtually no time whatsoever to do any changes in ballast. So it's, uh, yes, again, harking back to uh, when we were first at sea. Uh, yeah, it's uh, the time frames have come down a lot and it, it does have a, a very big impact on on what I can actually deliver. Yeah, I mean, I was quite uh, taken aback when I found out it was the, the priesthood. I spent a lot of time in North um, sort of uh, talking a lot about why aren't you checking your priesthood properly? You know, it used to be a real cornerstone uh, not only available to, to check, uh, you know, double check, the planner's doing multiple, multiple things. So it was a good sort of another slice of Swiss cheese in that layer, if you like, to say, you know, well, I've checked it and maybe you missed this and maybe you missed that because I'm only checking one plan, whereas you're checking, you know, a few. Um, but the other thing was the tanks. Uh, yeah. I mean, we used to ballast, uh, used to allow us the affordability to be able to ballast uh, the condition that was agreed between central planning and the vessel before you even arrived at the next port, um, which allowed you some um, peace of mind that your departure. And, and of course, uh, more so, it allowed you to ballast in such a manner, not just for departure Shanghai, but you, you knew that you could check for arrival Long Beach. Uh, as well, which is sometimes maybe, if you'd agree, I don't know, a bit short-lived yeah. with the terminal planners particularly. <laughs> yeah, I would definitely agree on that one. Um, yeah, I mean, re realistically, by the by the point I can deliver a, a, a pre-stow to the terminal, uh, we are so close to arrival that even if the vessel does have time to look at it, it's, it's way too late to start doing any kind of major ballast operations at that point. Um, if I if I had 24 hours before, I mean, although I'm I'm not actually working with uh, a load list that contains every single container and all the details, it's it's enough detail for me to have that conversation with the chief officer and say, you know, the back and forth where we we talk about what we're going to do with the tanks. Is there any way we can change the stow? Mm -hmm. Nowadays, pretty much when I send the plan to the terminal is exactly the same time I send it to the uh, to the vessel. Oh, and the terminal planner responsibilities, if you could just give us a bit of a run through of that, because what kind of problem is that causing? The fact that the vessel and the terminal are receiving uh, these uh, plans at the same time? Um, I mean, essentially what, what's happening is I'm, I'm ending up having multiple conversations at the same time with, with two different parties that have very different uh, priorities. Uh, from a vessel point of view, obviously, safety is number one. From a terminal point of view, they just want my vessel in and out as fast as we can possibly get it. So I already have a, a conflict in terms of priorities. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, when I'm even when I'm doing the pre stow I'm I'm looking at all of these things, but I'm also looking at, at it from a, a commercial angle as well. So not only mm -hmm. am, I, am I looking at you know, how am I going to place the boxes and make sure things like hazardous reefers are all in the right slots. I'm also looking at how do I get the seven cranes. I'm ensuring ensuring that I maximise the utilisation of the vessel, and I'm also doing the exact same thing as the ship. I'm not just looking at departure Shanghai. I'm also looking at arrival Long Beach because a ship that can sail from Shanghai in a safe condition but can't arrive isn't any use either. 
Uh, so I, I'm kind of sitting there with the, the sort of bigger picture um, than definitely the terminal. They're, they're only interested in what's going to happen right now. Yeah, I I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head a little bit for me there when you say that, you know, you're interested in, in productivity as well. And, and then the terminal is pretty much only interested in productivity and the vessel, theoretically speaking, should be only interested in safety, which is why we were probably jumping up and down so much, anything up to 12 hours before if we hadn't had that presto. But if you don't have those communication strings or the time to establish those communication strings, not only are you um, not checking, you, if you've not got those multiple sort of layers of checks to to the plan that's been done you're not um safely combining those aspects you know the the vessel's opinion uh, will be different but it's, it's it's got to be put into the mix a little bit there and if you're i mean in this case for the mv plutus at midnight the mate's not checking it and the pilot's on board at six in the morning it, it's it's really not getting checked at all by the vessel and i think another thing that's um certainly quite different when i when i first started planning was uh, pretty much everybody that I worked with in the, in the early days of my planning career was had been on container ships. So at least you <clears throat> you had that level of understanding in terms of stability and priorities. So you I mean you, you typically when you're when you're doing the stowage or uh, the pre-stowage, you you do the, you're doing the planning aspect in in one system. That's where I'm really looking at it from a commercial slash productivity point of view. Um, but before I even send it to the terminal, that's I'm taking the ship's tank condition. I'm using the exact same stability software that the ship has, and I'm kind of going back and forth with my plan, making sure I'm clearing all the errors. Yeah. Now, one of the issues that, that we definitely have nowadays is not everybody has been at sea, and that's that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, you know, you can have very very good planners who've never ever been at sea, but when you remove the, the the element where you can actually have that back and forth with the chief yeah. officer, yeah. you you are relying on the planner for the stability, where you don't have that second that second level uh, that we yeah. used to have. I think that was the biggest pushback we used to usually have, and I've discussed with you many times where the planner used to send things through and say this is going to be your tank condition for departure, and there'd be things like healing tanks both full to 100% just to sort of maximise that stowage, and and the you know that the mate would have to push back and say, look, I can't have those full. And then, but at least you were, at least you were having that conversation, and and you touched on the the sort of your software and how it works. Um, that's certainly something that, that we've been advocating in North is sort of standardization of software across across fleets. Um, I mean, you and I both worked back in the day for a company that had sort of four different softwares, depending on what kind of vessel you got on, which was, uh, you know, and you were learning during your handover from the last guy, not, not sort of necessarily learning um, a new system as you should. Um, and also something we see in North with regard to claims, and, and I'm sure a lot of the members listening in can can honestly agree with this. It's not necessarily the owned fleet that we have huge more problems with. We see a lot more problems with with the chartered fleets, and uh, often um, chartered tonnage will not have that crossover of software as well. Um, is that a fair comment? You think? Yeah, and um, I mean, there's, uh, I'd say there's another element to that that you you touched on before, which is. Um, I, as a central planner, I'm not just looking after one vessel. I, I might have seven or eight in various different ports uh, at any one time. And in an ideal scenario, you know, if, if, if we look at uh, the Asia Europe trade, typically it tends to be sister ships. So it's going to be the same software, different ships. But if I'm looking at, say, north south trades, I might have eight, eight different ships and eight different, com completely different stability programs. So my level of knowledge before we even get down to the vessel is going to be uh, limited because, you know, there's, there's so much I can learn with uh, even just one program. But yeah, it's um, certainly with charter ships, you do see it as more of a problem. Yeah, I, I think we see less issues um, with members that have um, some consistency to their software and good trading on that software. And, I, and another thing, you know, we, we do a lot of crew seminars and every time I bring this up, I, I get some sort of uh, more elderly captain tell me it isn't his job. But uh, familiarization with that software doesn't just start with a training course, maybe, you know, um, certainly we had the time deep sea to get the second mates and the third mates using uh, the software. So eventually they were the mates of tomorrow. Um, so a little bit of onboard training as well, you know. And I think that's, I mean, from a, even when the vessel's in port, it's a, it's a huge advantage if you have that because, I mean, we'll, we'll touch on it a little bit later, but 
I, I do expect the terminal to be coming down with revised load plans during the, the entire port stay. So if you do have second mate, third mate can work the stability software as well, even better. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, we're relying on waiting till four o'clock in the morning and the chief mate comes along. Um, so, yeah. I agree. It made life a lot easier for me when you knew you had a second mate or somebody that could that could help out a little bit in that front. And then when they were promoted to mate, it must be a bit of a weight off for, for everybody that you, you hit the ground running a little bit in that in that respect. Um, we, we touched on the fact that you, you've emailed out this uh, pre stow. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that I've seen recently with a few of these uh, stowage collapses, and I, th I think, well, I know that, that uh, the, the claims team and the law lawyers team will touch on it as well, is the sort of backtracking of all these different plans. And I, I think, you know, it's just a good time right at the beginning here to say that uh, evidence preservation should be there, expect the unexpected. Um, I think really. Yeah, I <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, even from a even so even before I send the stove, you know, I'm I'm once I'm moving from planning software to stability software and checking errors, I'm I'm going through huge number of iterations where I I realize there's a slashing error, and I have to go back, tweak the plan, back and forth. Mm -hmm. So that at that point, that's when I would send my my plan to the terminal. But really, what what I then need is the exact same thing from the terminal. So once they've they take they will take typically four to six hours to do the terminal planning side as well. I need to be seeing their first version of the file because they don't have the stability software. Even if they did have the stability software, they don't have the necessarily the knowledge on how to use it. So every time I get a file back from the terminal, I need to be checking that against my stability software. Any errors that are in there, I need to correct them. I again, need to send it back to the terminal. So. I mean, typically all of this is just in, in emails. Um, every time I read in a new load plan from the terminal, it wipes out everything in my, my stereo plan. So um, if I'm if I'm organized, I will actually be saving all of these files and archiving them somewhere, uh, or I could just be relying on the fact that they're in the emails. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of people, uh, we see it a lot, you know, we start getting an expert involved and they start asking for the BAP please, and it seems unbelievably difficult to find these emails after a while and uh, I think that the preservation starts starts there with that first one that you send out okay let's have a formal way of keeping track of these on board uh, in the planning office and for the terminal as well because there'll be it's not always that everybody's in copy either is it you know you and the terminal planner maybe having a discussion without the ship in it as well so I think that it's something that Craig Tom and, and Gillian and the guys will will touch on in a little yeah. bit yeah, and I mean, just to give you a sense of uh, why it's, it is so difficult to find thing, anything in the emails is, um, I mean, typically a storage center is split up into trades. Um, so if you're looking at the Asia Europe trade team, which may may only have eight, ten people, you're probably getting to the mailbox for that that team anything anywhere between five to ten thousand emails a day. Mm -hmm. So when you start trying to go back a year, two years unless you really know exactly what you're looking for, it can be incredibly hard to find. Yeah, I think uh, giving that some thought of formalising that process would help in the long run. Um, I mean, the ship, we joked about it the other day for us. We, you know, we had a document retention policy, but the, it was sort of a USB stick, plans, paperwork, a brown envelope in a locker, five years, uh, chuck it. Uh, if anybody have ever asked us to find anything, it would have been quite hard work. Uh, so, you know, having seen the other side of that now, um, I, I can understand uh, the difficulties involved. So the Presto is in. Uh, we've discussed why the Presto is important and why communications and that triangle of communications between vessel, central planner and terminal planner is so important and has shall we say over the last few years maybe been eroded uh, a little bit to make these this this quite a difficult process for most of the parties yeah it become i mean it's a constant juggling act when you're when you're talking storage i mean <clears throat> yeah it, it, as i say i mean even though i might be i might have eight ships that i'm managing it at any one time you know, of course not all eight are going to be coming into port at the exact same time but i actually might have two maybe even three that are, are overlapping at any one point so um the amount of communication that's going on is is huge or at least it should be huge yeah, yeah. Um, a, a of, I, from an ideal world you know, in an ideal scenario a, a communicative terminal is the best for me 
Uh, not not so great from a sleep aspect, but <laughs> I would rather, I'd rather be there that they were calling me and asking questions when they're doing this. They're, they're part of the pre-planning. Yeah. And, you know, I've got more boxes, less boxes, um, rather than just okay doing what they want to do and then presenting it to the ship on arrival. Yeah, no problem. Um, so the vessel uh, has got its presto. However, the mate gets up. Uh, uh, 0600 pilot on board Shanghai. The vessel berths alongside in Shanghai. So once again, I'll, I'll put myself back to how it used to go. Uh, get alongside, straight down from the bridges, mate, into the ship's office. First person that you sit there and meet and start this communication string that we talked about before kind of almost shifts a little bit away from the central planner for the vessel at this point and you start to build that relationship and communications with the terminal planner now these days uh we've already sort of said in the case of the plutus here she the terminal planner and the vessel got that presto at the same time uh, the mate hasn't had a chance to check it and really give any comments on it nor do any tank conditions uh, or ballasting as he, as he should have been able to, as we all know, really, ballasting alongside is not not really good practice. Um, given all that, what is the accuracy of this plan now? Because, you know, we would have made those comments and then the initial plan when you got alongside would have reflected the comments mm -hmm. that you'd had with central planning on the Priesto. Yeah, so, I mean, the, re the reason it's so important that um, I get a file back from the terminal as fast as possible is because as I said at the beginning, I mean, when my load list, uh, aside from the uh, hazardous, the reefers and the outer gauge, it's it's a combination of real boxes that we know are on the terminal plus what we expect to be on the terminal. So when the terminal is doing their planning, I, I don't expect them to match every single uh, container position with every single cell that I loaded. I have I have to give them some flexibility because, you know, um, the terminal they have their own challenges they they know where the boxes are in the yard where i whereas i don't so what i'm really looking for the terminal to do when they're doing their pre-planning is they, so they take my initial plan and what i'm looking for them to do is match each shell position with a container that has same port of discharge same size type and same weight plus or minus one or two tons for my plan now if i don't get that file back uh, before the ship arrives I don't have any opportunity to go through that that plan and actually look <clears throat> and fix any of these errors. And this this is typically where we're starting to see the, the problem creeping in is mm. that ship uh, terminal planner comes down, chief officer, here's your file. A whole load of errors are now popping up in the system uh, that we we just haven't had time to even look at um, because of the the you know how close we are, we now are with the deadlines. Um, so it's it's already the kind of communication is starting to break down and almost the, the sort of trust between the central planner and the vessel because you're going, but what you sent me is completely different to what the terminal sent me. And had I had that opportunity to have those conversations with you first and the terminal separately, actually what you had and then what the terminal delivered would would be much closer to what you're seeing. Um, you're not seeing the gaps right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that that used to be it used to get to know the central planner quite well. Mm. Um but the terminal planner for us on board had as well as the obvious things of the plan, they were usually, particularly in places like Shanghai or where English isn't the native uh, language, they were a, a cornerstone of communications for the entire operation for the ship. Uh, and I'll touch on a couple of things like lashings later where the terminal planner was super helpful mm -hmm. in, um, in in being able to communicate with other parties involved on your behalf because they usually had pretty good pretty good English. And I also hear from some of the, the chief mates and masters that we work with that the initial plan isn't even often delivered. Uh, it's just work off that priesto. Uh, yeah, I mean, in some places I, I wouldn't be at all surprised. Um, <laughs> Right. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, a lot of it is, is uh, as you touched on, it's it's very location specific. Um, I mean, so, some some ports. I mean, Japan is the kind of the obvious example. I get a complete load 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 list that will not change forty eight hours before the ship arrives. Um, so, and what I plan, the terminal will plan it exactly. Um, but that's it's a very specific, um, <clears throat> very specific to Japan. You don't see that anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. So somewhere like Shanghai. 
Um, I've already got tight deadlines. I've already got a language uh, challenge, and you know, it's it. <laughs> all of these things, these things come together, and um, yeah. we're already heading for a for a problem. Yeah, yeah. So uh, initial plan did come in this case, but it wasn't much different to the Priesto. So the chief mate on the the Plutus uh, uh, is kind of left with a semi finished uh, plan almost at this stage. Uh, cargo ops do commence, as we know, uh, particularly in Asia, very quick moving. Um, the the lashing gangs are often getting put in on by the by the spreader rather than even up the gangway to to get things moving that much faster. And as expected, she has seven cranes alongside when cargo ops commence. Changes to the arrived boxes uh, are ongoing, uh, which is not unusual these days. Um, so if those changes are ongoing, um, are central planner always told of ongoing changes? So it, it, it very much depends. I mean, you've, you've got a, a couple of phases to this. I mean, first of all, once once the terminal planner gets on board with the chief officer, um, normally, you know, in this in this case, there I would expect there would be some lashing errors that have crept in uh, because I've just not had time to to look at the file. So there will be that initial conversation where terminal planner and chief officer are kind of fixing those. And if it's if it's a case of just simple switch this box for this box, then I, I don't need to get involved in that. If it starts to become a, a bigger change, then usually either the chief officer or the terminal planner or both will phone me and we'll, we'll start to do bigger changes to the plan. But as you said, I mean, they, they've already started cargo operations. And if we're talking seven cranes, Shanghai, 35, 40 moves an hour on each crane. If it takes us an hour to do that plan, uh, to finalize that plan and fix the errors, we already have quite a lot of boxes on board that aren't going to be going anywhere. Uh, now, when it when it comes to actual cargo operations, so assuming chief officer signed off on it, everything's looking good. Um, I always expect there to be some changes during the cargo ops because you know, there's congestion in the yard. The crane is not going to stop and wait for one particular box. They're just going to switch it out for another one. Um, so there are always going to be minor changes happening uh, the whole time in, in any port. It's not specific to uh, Shanghai. Mm. But what, what I need is, and what the vessel needs, is I need to be getting an updated file at least every six hours. Just so again, uh, so again, I can take that file, I can read it, I can check, check against the stability, I can make sure, OK, with the amendments they've made, OK, I've now got some lashing errors creeping in. So again, I can call them back. I can I can make the changes. Same with the ship. Um, again, deliver it on board at the same time. One of the <clears throat> one of the bigger challenges I actually see or have seen is terminals that can be quite good at sending the file, but they don't tell you about it. Uh, they assume that you're sitting there in front of the screen 24 hours a day. And I've, I've even had Apply files come back from terminals with a note at the bottom saying, um, "Here's the updated file. If no, you know, if no response received in 20 minutes, we'll take that as everything's fine." Uh, so, right. so you'd be better off with some kind of uh, almost formal approval process as opposed to silence is the key. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, some, some, I mean, definitely in some cases, I know terminals don't want to phone me because they know that I'll look at it and I will find things and I will start making changes and that starts to interrupt their productivity. So it varies from terminal to terminal, but uh, I'm ready to encroach on their their priorities. If, if you're not told of the smaller changes, how often would you expect the uh, you to be updated roughly? Um, as long as I'm getting a file every six hours or so, that, that, that's good enough. And same for, same for the ship. Um, so we've it's it's almost like a double layer of, of protection here. You know, if if I don't see the file, hopefully the ship is going to see the file and get, catch the errors. Okay. Um, and of course, these emails going backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. Um, we mentioned earlier about trying to dig these emails out um, eventually, and, and they're starting to build up somewhat at this point. I mean, I mean, another challenge you've got there when it comes to actually backing track and looking for evidence is a lot of this stuff just happens over the phone. And uh, it can be as, as simple as terminal planner phoning me up and saying, OK, I, this one crane is, is slowing down. Can I move some boxes from this bay to this bay? Now, from a, if, if I'm purely looking at it from a productivity point of view, and I know it's that both of those bays are for the same discharge port, 
then it could be, yep, yeah, okay, that's fine. Uh, just send me a file. Now, whether they send me a file or not becomes debatable, but of course you can't track back a phone call. Yeah. Uh, I no, no way of proving that what. Gillian, did you have uh... Yeah, forgive me for interrupting. I know this is something which, um, as we've talked about this uh, this seminar, it's something which cropped up quite a lot. Um, obviously, the amount of information that's moving, uh, Tom, between you and the terminal and, and, and everybody else involved, really. Before we move into the P&I elements, what would be your advice in respect to, to data management? Because obviously, as we'll talk about later on, we find that it's incredibly difficult to obtain as much information as we can. As John says, we look at BAPLIs, we look at other information. What would your recommendation be in terms of data management on, on, an, on a rolling basis, not just in the event of a casualty? Yeah, I mean, as a, as a general rule, I would say I, I don't just want to be archiving properly the, the final battery in my pre -store. I want to, I really would want to have every single file that I received during that port call. And <clears throat> I, I should be, I should have somewhere that I'm saving that. So standardized format, vessel, voyage, port call. And then you know every every time I get a file, it has a timestamp, so you can you can actually from that you can you can go back and you can track the changes that were happening. Um, mm -hmm. I, if you if you're only getting the okay, here's the final back, this is what it looked like. What you're missing mm -hmm. is a lot of the context. You you don't you don't know how we ended up at that point, and it's yeah, it, that, that's where it falls down. So it's it's really retaining those files somewhere outside of the email chain. So we're looking for the emails presumably as well, because obviously they provide a degree of that context as well in terms yeah. of when, how, from whom, et cetera, as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's ideal if you've got both, that's fantastic. Um, but it, even if you, you can just only get the battery files, then as long as the central planner is, is saving them every time they come in, um, then you can actually track back. Uh, yes, you're still missing some of the context that was in the conversations, but at least you have the, the data and you can see how it progressed and were these errors showing up before the ship sailed or is it something that just appeared right at the very end? Yes. I guess I, I can interject a little bit from the claims perspective as well there, Gillian. I mean, as a carrier, we're regularly confronted um, on stow collapse cases with arguments of stacks being overweight, exceeding their permissible forces, etc. And it's important that we, you know, the claims team know what the situation with the boxes were, why, and as Tom says, when, when and why changes were made, um, so that we can determine if any of those switches, say, um, could have been causative to the incident, and that's going to help us develop our uh, reaction to um, to allegations. So, um, just to reiterate, seeing the evolution of the plan um, and the cover emails is really going to help from an evidence preservation point of view from the, from the claims perspective. Great, thanks, Tom. Cheers, Tom. Thanks, Gillian. Um, so the Plutus is on a uh, dangerous street, <laughs> shall we say. <laughs> uh, cargo ops are ongoing. Um, as we heard from you earlier, Tom, the terminal planner doesn't usually have sort of uh, the, the same lashing module, uh, hydrostatic particulars in, in the software as uh, central planning in the vessel in a, in a lot of cases. And that is sort of borne out by what we see in the club. Uh, lots of final stows with sort of high cubes top to bottom where the CSM clearly says sort of bottom three tiers must be eight foot six and things like that, you know. So it's been a case of, oh, you, you can go uh, 12 high, stick them 12 high and uh, the, the sort of basics are covered, but not the sort of intricate details and uh we've stolen um the net the, the draft uh, icon you see there directly from um, a recent maib case where the crew went down to the key on completion of cargo ops found well over a meter out drafts uh, did nothing they recorded it and sailed anyway and of course the reason i bring that up is it because it directly uh, impacts the gm and the GM is the one thing that I would say 80, between 80 and 90 percent of the stowage collapses and box losses that we see in the club. Uh, the GM is, you know, twice, two and a half times that of the cargo securing manual uh, sort of uh, calculation. And uh, whilst that in itself is OK, they don't seem to have changed the weights uh, in the cargo securing manual. So they've gone to max weight on the whole bay, but for a GM of say two meters when they're actually tramping around with it at four or five or more meters. So what you were saying about the software earlier and, and the access to that kind of information and the central planner being almost cut out of it, who has that information mm -hmm. uh, sort of bears, bears what we see uh, true. Um, 
the other thing just touch on there is lashings and i mentioned earlier that the terminal planner was a kind of linchpin for english uh, for us uh, one of the things we see a lot is lashings um not necessarily not tightened up but not in the correct configuration and all these box boats have uh, various uh, lashing configurations what we always used to do was get the central the uh, terminal planner sorry to um, take out copies of the lashing configurations for each bay and try and uh, convey to the foreman on deck at that time in, in local dialect what what we were expecting and then of course we've seen a few recently where crew wait till mm -hmm. cargo is finished out they go to check the lashings uh, when everything is complete rather than trying to stay on top of that so that changes can be made to the lashings as they go along um so yeah the plutus has uh, got drafts out a little bit um about half a meter but the crew record that in the fre 13 in the official logbook and don't really think much of it um of course the knock-on consequences of this is they're not entirely sure what their gm is so when the final plan comes down um, it was delivered by the agent in this case the chief mate fires it up in the stability software and there are several uh, problems uh, and red lights for uh, tier weight stack weights and lashing it acceleration forces particularly on bay 76 which is the after bay above the poop deck i don't think that i am exaggerating anything here to say that that is a relatively common uh, from what you've said already tom as well really <clears throat> yeah um and i mean this is this is where the kind of the communication, if, if it's not been going, this is where it really falls down. Um, ideally, even if the, the terminal hasn't been giving the, the vessel and me files during the port call, I, I would at least want the battery, final battery file about an hour before the ship sails, uh, so we have time to fix things. But what is increasingly common is when we actually get that final file, it's going to be chief officer is the first one to see it, and it's typically delivered by the agent. Cargo ops have already finished. All seven cranes have disappeared somewhere else. Tugs are standing by, pilots on board, and you check it, and suddenly we have a load of errors. And at this point, you know, it's incredibly challenging to get the terminal to do anything because from their point of view, I'm finished. Uh, I just want your vessel out. Um, and even from a, a central planner point of view, it's actually quite rare that uh, the chief officer would call me at this point because yeah, he knows that there's very little I can do. Mm. There's a bit of an erosion in communications already in, in this particular case as well. Uh, you know, if you knew Central Planner well, you might think, well, I'm going to wake him up. Uh, but in this case, that sort of relationship hasn't really been given the time to build. So as you say, plenty of alarms. The master has now got no cranes. They've all gone somewhere else and he's under quite a bit of pressure to get going. Um, so he does try and play with some tanks on the way through the river. Uh, the pressure is there to depart. And so uh, off he goes. Now on passage, um, some of the weather that's coming in, Pacific was always one of my least favourite places in the world. Um, and off, off he goes. Uh, there's a developing depression to the north. So he decides to amend his track. You can see there the grey line is the original uh, great circle that he was going to take. Uh, he decides to drop to the south a little bit and then spring from a different location to a slightly different great circle. Of course, if you remember back, the speed required was already quite close to the the, the scheduled uh, speed so he's adding a bit of distance here so he hasn't got much to play with um heavy weather is coming in so he sends the crew out to do some tra uh, checks uh, one of the recent meiv reports had this logged as checks done to a 10,000 tu box boat in two hours um, now anybody that's ever served on a container ship will tell you that you couldn't even do that on a four and a half thousand TEU box boat. So again, get these things done properly, get them logged properly, get the evidence that you did them preserved properly. The vessel develops a quarter swell on the port side. She starts to roll up to 20 to 25 degrees, steady away. The master does try and move the heading a little bit, but it's quite difficult to get rid of it at this stage. Um, overnight, in the hours of darkness there is some noise but when the sparky goes out in the morning to check the reefers he finds predominantly on base 76 and a few other bays just aft of the funnel stack that there have been some uh, boxes lost a quick tally up of those boxes looks at approximately 92 boxes are completely unaccounted for with plenty more damaged 
crew make safe as best as they can. And then, of course, the members call Gillian and Joe. At this point, I'll hand over to you, Gillian and Joe. Thanks for that, John. Um, I hope everybody followed that. That was very interesting. What we're going to do now is just move on to what the next next steps would be. Um, now, as John's mentioned, there's um, there's a lot goes on before all of this. So when the initial incident happens, we don't necessarily always have a clear view from the ship or from the members to exactly what's happened. Um, we may have an idea of numbers, we may have an idea of damage to an extent, but what we don't have is an idea of exactly what's caused it, because obviously none of the, the steps that John's outlined have, have been known at this stage. So that call to the club very much puts us in a position where we're there to start unpicking and trying to work out um, how we move this forward, not only to make safe, but to start protecting members' position as we go on. And of course, ultimately to come to a, a conclusion as to causation and liability. Um, those steps that we have to take then are intended to start gathering that information, to start gathering that documentation, start putting a team together that will work literally together to be able to, to, to create the picture that we need. Um, on that basis, we start looking at the team. We obviously have a lot of experience in house. We also have a fantastic loss prevention team, as, as I'm sure John will attest to. Um, but we also then start looking towards external parties as well, those best placed to help us. Um, these can range, obviously, from um, from experts in their field, be it via, obviously, in Tom's case, looking at storage and planning, um, and also moving on, of course, to lawyers, um, so that we can start building that report. And I noticed Tom has very kindly turned his camera on, which helps me in sort of introducing Tom, because this is the part where I hand over to him and ask him to run through the main considerations once he has been brought in in a matter such as this. So, can I hand over to you, Tom? Absolutely, Gillian. Yes. Um... So we tend to, of course, the club finds out immediately the problems that have happened overnight. And then we normally get a call. It's never a good time, but we normally get a call quite early on um, explaining the problem. And um, as lawyers or as, as the claims team, what we want to do is try and build a roadmap um, of where we're going. And to do that, we need an overall picture of the casualty to understand properly the potential exposure for the member in the club. And that's probably going to involve at least two things early on. The first is to identify causation as early as possible. Now that on a matter such as the MV Plutus, that's probably going to involve um, instructing a naval architect, getting somebody reserved straight away and sending out either one of HFW's master mariners or um, master mariner from the experts out to the casualty as soon as possible. Now what they're going to be doing is um, as, you, as you well know, we'll be obtaining all the contemporaneous evidence. They'll be speaking with the crew. Um, and so on the case study such as this, they're going to be looking at things like any alarms raised departing Shanghai. Did the officer of the watch see anything about the incident? What did the weather look like before departing um, Shanghai? What did it look like just before the event? And foreshadowing any accusations that we might see from uh, claimants, we're probably going to ask the naval arc to take pictures of as much of the um, undamaged stows as possible, stacks as, as possible, so that straight away we can say, well, uh, the vessel was in accordance with the lashing plan as per the uh, cargo securing manual, and we can, you know, we can we can knock that off. Of course, there's always a problem that you can't see what the lashing plan was for the containers that have gone overboard. But it's important for us early to get a picture of liability. Where is this headed? And that's going to help us as lawyers advise on how um, we deal with the casualty, how cooperative we are with opponents or with slot charterers or time charterers, depending who we are as owners or carriers or charterers. Um, bearing in mind always that stow collapses tend not to be straightforward when it comes to causation. Um, the second thing is we'll probably be identifying who's involved, uh, who we should be speaking to, what the likely exposure is. To do that, we're going to need the contracts. We're going to need to know our counterparties quite early. For uh, I think the MV Plutus is a 10,000 TU vessel. We'd expect that pr probably to be operating in um, a time charter party and under a slot arrangement. Um, so that's immediately going to tell us who we need to speak to, the flow of information. And then it's important to identify the boxes themselves and uh, to know what contents there w w was in them. Unfortunately, just prior to Christmas, a voyage from Shanghai to US, it looks like this is probably going to contain fully laden containers um, with everyone's Christmas presents in. And we can expect um, 
we can expect that to cause a, a number of problems. There's also esoteric problems with the ports of destination or the ports of loading in the US. Uh, it tends to be quite an arrest friendly jurisdiction. So any FOB buyers might be waiting there to um, put the crew under depositions to try and arrest the vessel. Likewise, any sellers who's in China who still retain title to sue, maybe they are um, looking to ignore bill of lading clauses and bring aggressive action in China. So they're the types of things that, 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 that we're trying to figure out just from a uh, factual analysis um, at the start, and that's going to help us develop a roadmap going forward. Tom, can I just, just jump back to, to when you were talking earlier on about uh, making sure you have the list of containers and, and the store plans and everything else? And obviously a lot of this we've, we've heard from Tom, um, Tom Bebbington, I should say, in relation to how these plans are moving back and forth and there are changes made that sometimes they're notified of, hopefully other times not. And you mentioned it was important to, to make sure that doesn't happen. How important is it? I mean, obviously, we, we, you and I, we've talked, we, we, we know this happens more than once. What impact does that have, both in the early stages and later on? And why is it so, so important? I, I think it goes back to, I mean, we always harp on as lawyers, just um, building up that evidential case, mm -hmm. making your case as robust as possible. Now, um, especially, I might come on to it shortly, but especially in the current climate, we see a lot of cargo claimants or claims coming in. Um, relying on um, carriers exercise, you know, having to having the burden of proof to show they properly handled, stowed, carried, took care of the cargo, and um, they could, after some recent case law like the Vol Cafe, they can sit back and just say, well, it's all on you to do. Now that's a really high, you know, there's a lot of evidence to create that um, to rely on any of your Hague Visby rule exceptions. So here it might be perils of the sea, it might be. Um, negligent navigation, um, you've got to prove that your vessel was seaworthy uh, before and at the beginning of the voyage. Now, to do that, you have to show that all the stacks were were, were in order in, in accordance with the lashing plan, the weights were correct, you knew where the boxes were, and it's just creating these little evidential steps, and uh, and that's why it's so important to, um, to be able to know where to get them uh, as early as possible. Tom, can I ask a question as well? I mean, the boxes are lost over at the bottom of the sea, obviously, and so evidentially that's challenging. But you know there is um, a, a high, quite a high incidence of misdeclared cargoes potentially. Um, just I'm assuming that the back and forth on the stowage plan might help to sort of forensically work out mis stowage or perhaps be able to calculate percentage. Um, it's a challenge, but is it something that you kind of, sort of could give any tips on how to manage that, or is it uh, it's, it's misdeclared? It's misdeclared. How can we know? Um, I, I guess it, it helps. Um, you, you'll, you'll, you and the members will know slightly more about this than this. It helps to point to your SMS plans to show what you do to check for um, misdeclared cargoes. So show that you've exercised as much care as possible. Um, then what you can do to perhaps to illustrate the point is to go through intact boxes, go through the cargo manifest for all of those boxes, say that these these were Mr. Clare or these 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 showed up on our um, system, the the loading software. So what we might do is is instruct someone like Mr. Bebbington to go back and um, and go over all of these uh, iterations of the plans. They might say, well, look at that one at um, 1100 hours, that plan we pointed out that that was a misdeclared cargo or that didn't manage up. The loading software flagged this and show you're, you're showing good practice. Um, whereas we can't speak for the boxes that have gone overboard, you can show good practice for the ones that were, were, were safe. That's helpful. Thanks, Tom. Is it uh, um, Craig's time so to... Quickly add to, add to that. Um, I think if you were trying to allege a uh, misdeclared cargo was the overall cause um, of the stack collapse, then uh, you've got, you know, the question then is uh, from whose perspective? If it's going to be the owner who's trying to prove seaworthiness, um, then uh, they'd be trying to use, for example, an article for Rule 2Q defence saying the incident was caused and uh, notwithstanding due diligence to make the seaworthy, it was something beyond my control, effectively. That's what Article 42Q says. 
as, as Joanne said, though, the difficulty for the owner or the carrier in those circumstances is going to be uh, proving that there definitely was a misdeclared cargo, given that the stack in which the alleged misdeclared cargo was in has disappeared into the soup. So what you'll be trying to do is to try to audit back the whole supply chain uh, for the boxes which go back to try to ascertain if there was a misrepresentation of VGM uh, for the for a box um, and then try to pin it on somebody. I, I would say my instinct, having done lots of these over the years, is that's always going to be quite a hard task. Um, you know, if somebody's gone to the effort of misdeclaring a cargo, they fooled a whole bunch of people on the way to, to doing that. Um, number one, so it's going to be quite difficult. But then proving that that individual box caused the loss over board of 92 boxes here, or 91, whatever the figure was, um, rather than an aggregation of other causes, is going to be quite hard. It's, it's you know, if we're looking for a, something to protect owners, it's, it's worth looking at, but instinct is that's generally quite a hard allegation to rely upon. Okay, thanks, Craig. Thank you. And apologies, Tom, for having jumped into you earlier on. I don't know if you want to carry on where you were, sorry. No, not at all. I think we're probably ready for the next slide. Craig's going to take us through um, some of the, um, the myriad of parties that are, that are involved in something like this. Great. Thanks, thanks, Tom and uh, Julia. So um, as Tom said, what we want to be doing as the claims team is to try to get an overall picture of the, uh, the circumstances of the loss. And that will include the facts, what actually went on, interviewing the crew, uh, obtaining the, the, elements, uh, uh, the evidence as to what happened at the last two load ports, uh, potentially going back even further than that, um, evidence as to the change in the voyage direction, weather, uh, sea conditions, so on and so forth. But another key part in ascertaining the overall picture and thereby helping to build a, an overall sort of game plan or direction of travel is understanding your contracts. Um, so what we try to do with these casualties at an early stage as possible is try to map out the contractual relationships. We want to know where the parties are in the overall contractual matrix who have suffered the losses. And we want to know against whom in the first instance under a contract they're obliged to bring the claim. And then when that party who uh, first faces the claim in the first instance, how are they going to pass that claim up the contractual chain and ultimately to whom? So what we want to do is to map out the relationships as quickly as possible, identify where we, our client, fits in that contractual matrix, and then the direct contracts that our client has and with whom and on what basis. Because we want to see the direction of claims. We also want to see the rights um, of those with whom we have a contract. So if we are on here for the owner of the vessel or the time charter of the vessel who's actually operating it, because here we, in this example for the Plutus, we've got a box time charter because the vessel's been chartered in from a non-operating owner uh, to, a, to a vessel operating a uh, shipping line, um, we've got a box time charter. So I want to be understanding what are the rights of my counterpart if I'm the owner, I want to know what rights does the liner operator have to documents? What rights does the liner operator have to get on my ship? What rights does the uh, the uh, the liner operator have um, in terms of getting data downloads? And what does it already have? If I'm on for the liner operator, I want to know um, what I can get from the owner and whether I can uh, obtain documents. Equally, though, I want to know what obligations, if I'm the liner operator in the middle of this, diagram that I have to alliance with any other party with whom I contract. And you'll remember from John's introduction that this vessel um, it, on its trade, it has uh, an alliance relationship with two other shipping lines. We've called them alliance member A and B here, but it also has a slot charter relationship with a slot charter. So I want to know what rights I have against them and they have against me for documents, for evidence, etc. And I also want to know who's responsible for what. Because the liner operator here, as you can see in this diagram, has terminal handling agreements with terminals on the both sides of the ship diagram. But equally, those alliance members and the slot charterer probably have direct relationships 
with the port of Shanghai and the port of Singapore for the boxes that were loaded on for their behalf. So what I also want to understand is under those alliance agreements, that alliance agreement and the slot charter, who was responsible for loading the boxes? Who was responsible for stowing the boxes? Was it the liner operator or was it the alliance member? And then as between the liner operator and the owner, who's responsible? And we want to map these things out because if there was a problem in execution of the storage plan um, by a terminal operator, with whom did they contract when they were undertaking that storage and loading exercise? Um, I also want to know what protections, if I'm the owner or I'm the operator, that I've got from other parties. Are they under an obligation to protect me from claims by their customers under their bills of lading? And then, probably most importantly, I want to be thinking about the liability regime. What is the liability regime in all of these contracts here um, that I have directly with somebody or the counterparts with whom I have contracts? What are they under in respect to their contracts? So I want to map this all out. Now, most of these contracts for ocean carriage will be subject to a version of the Hague or the Hague Visby rules. So the box time charter is likely to contain the Hague or Hague Visby regime. Um, the most up to date version of it indeed has a equivalent of a clause paramount. The alliance agreements will include slot charter, which probably have Hague and Hague Visby regime. And, all, and everybody's bills will probably have a version of Hague or Hague Visby regime. Now, this vessel was going to the US. Most liner bills of lading will include uh, a, a jurisdiction clause which provides for one main jurisdiction, often English law, if that's Maersk or MSC or Evergreen. But sometimes if the movement's to or from the US, it will be US law and US jurisdiction. So I want to better map those out. What law is going to apply ultimately to the claims which arise under the bills and then the claims which um, will be brought by the slot charterers and the BSA partners against the liner operator and then the liner operator against me. What's the liability regime? As I said, probably Hague and Hague Visby. Um, having done the initial research into the probable causes and interviewed the crew, hopefully way before the vessel arrives at uh, the West Coast, I've got a pretty good idea whether I'm in the firing line or somebody else is in the firing line. And that will then inform the strategy that we take. Won't be perfect, but it gives us a working proposition on which to work. So that's all I wanted to say. Um, I don't know if Tom wanted to say a few words, Gillian, if you think there's time on the, um, the uh, I suppose might say the trends in relation to construing uh, the duty to exercise due diligence to make the vessel seaworthy under those Hague type regimes. Or maybe we've run out of time for that. I'm going, to, I'm going to take a bit of a liberty with, with our guests and say that although I probably did take a bit of your time up on the seaworthiness aspect earlier when I perhaps uh, probably was a little bit preemptive, if you could make a few comments, Tom, just for a couple of minutes, Definitely. that would be great. It's worth hearing. Thanks, John. Absolutely. Yeah, that that's um, happy to. So Craig sort of uh, intimated that it'll be the liability regime and under one of the Hague, Hague Visby uh, that will apply here. And on a situation such as the Plutus, we can expect that uh, owners or, or carriers will face um, accusations of an ina inadequate stow or perhaps an inadequate passage plan, given the vessel still um, ended up passing through the area of low pressure. And so um, before owners or, carry or the carrier can rely on any of the permitted Article 4 exceptions, they're going to need to establish that the vessel was seaworthy. Um, and as Craig alluded to, um, there's a perception at the moment, at least in English law, that some of the recent decisions are quite cargo friendly. Um, and so there's a bit of risk um, on the part of carriers aligned to the fact that the, we're trading at the moment in very turbulent times. There's a great demand on liner services at present, and that might mean less vessels um, or more idle time. It might mean more ad hoc calls to ports that uh, the crew are un unused to, older tonnage being held onto. Um, and there's also ever larger vessels entering the fleet. And so with that comes the risk for potential human error. Um, and cargo claimants know that, and they know some of the recent case law. I, I won't go into any detail on it, but we I previously talked about the Volcafe decision, which puts the burden of proof uh, now on the carrier to show that they um, properly handled, um, cared for the cargo under their Article 3.2 obligations. Um, so really what the carrier has to do is disprove causative negligence. Um, and for good measure on cases like this, we often see cargo claimants sitting back and saying, um, we're not going to put a positive case. The fact that the um, stow collapsed is evidence in itself 
that um, that you were at fault. And for good measure, we're going to say that the crew was incompetent. We're going to say the uh, vessel's SMS was insufficient. And owners are forced to go through really quite a painstaking disclosure exercise to prove that actually that wasn't the case. So I'm thinking of things like the training documents for all crew members, appraisals, non-conformities, audits, um, which is going to be at a great expense. And sometimes that threat of the legal expense is what cargo claimants are hoping to put forward with a view to getting a chunky settlement. Um, just to finish, Gillian, I, I should say it's not all doom and gloom. We don't want to finish on that note. Um, you know, most of these new cases, so I, I have in mind CMA, CGM, Libra for passage planning, which is, which is um, of course, up for a, a appeal at the Supreme Court this year, um, and the Vol Cafe. Well, they can be distinguished quite often on the facts. Um, take this case, for example. Um, if it was the case, which I think it was, the passage plan was um, amended during the voyage, then arguably it wouldn't follow the Libra because at the commencement of voyage, uh, the passage plan may have been fine. Uh, the amended passage plan, which may have been defective um, and which may have caused the vessel to be seaworthy, may have been something that happened after the commencement of the voyage. Likewise, we can do a lot to push claimants to properly particularise their allegations and put cost markers down if they fail to do so. Um, but I guess I'd finish with just saying generally, um, there's no substitute for having your evidence in order. Um, and if claimants see at an early stage that there's a proper implementation of the vessel's SMS um, by the shipping line or the managers, and it's not simply a box ticking exercise, we find it tends to be um, an easier claim to, to bat away. That's, uh, I, I, hope that, I hope that was all right for a little roundup on those matters. No, absolutely. Thank you, Tom. And thank you to Craig also for, for your comment. It is much appreciated. And sorry, if I feel like I have to rush you in the last sort of few minutes. I'm going to hand back over to John in just a second. Um, all I want to do really, because I'm, I'm obviously pushed for time as well, is just to really highlight, as Tom has done, um, the need for uh, the maintenance of data and of information, um, both at the stages before the casualty and afterwards. Um, in order to, to make all of this easier, um, if we can. I say I'm not going to specifics, we are pushed for time. I'm going to hand it back to John now, if I can, uh, just yep. to finish up, John. Cheers. Thank you, Julian. Tom and Craig, excellent. Um, as you heard, that's that's pretty much it. Uh, six words to come out of it. Evidence, 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 communications, communications, communications. Um, there has been a slight drop recently, not just in the container ship trade, but in general of crews preserving evidence. So it'd be nice to see that getting back on track. Um, we have got, which isn't on this slide, unfortunately, but soon that we are launching our Mariner's role in collecting evidence, which will um, include container issues. And that will be on an app as well as a book. So your crews should be able to upload their evidence to the app uh, in, in, the, in a modern 2021 fashion. So you can go on our website as members and get access to any of our publications to do with container shipping. Um, and of course, Craig, uh, Tom M and of course, Tom B are more than happy to talk to you, I imagine, at any time. Uh, as such, any questions you have, you can send directly to the club or if it's something deeply technical to do with planning, I suggest you go directly to Tom Bevington. Uh, and of course, there's the email addresses for Tom Morgan and Craig Neem as well, should you have any further questions. I, uh, it really falls on me just to thank the whole panel, uh, Tom Bevington, Tom Morgan, Craig Neem and Craig, um, sorry, Gillian and Joanne for their help in setting this up. And thank you all for attending. Um, as I said, there are many, many causative factors to these things. We've looked at planning and the aftermath in this one. Maybe in the future, if uh, people want it, we can look at some other causative factors um, and do more container ship webinars for you. I really appreciate all your time. I know you're very busy people. So thank you very much and uh, see you again soon, I hope. Take care.